morning of November 16, 1971, D.C. resident Mary Woodard was waiting at her usual bus stop on her way to work, but the bus was late. Spying a crowd of police and civilians nearby, she walked towards the commotion to see what was happening. She noticed they were circling a discarded wig and remarked to a friend that her daughter wore one just like it. A few moments later, she would come to find that the body of her 18-year-old daughter, Brenda Denise Woodard, was found near the wig. Brenda was the fifth victim of the menace who had come to be known as the Freeway Phantom Killer. From 1971 to 1972, the unknown murderer took the lives of at least six black girls ages 10 to 18 around D.C. The killings aroused little public interest and the investigation was doomed from the start. However, a group of gang rapists and a lone suspect would come to be credibly linked to the murders. Why was the killer never officially found? Who were the girls slain in D.C. and often forgotten about. In this episode of It's a Mystery, we'll be discussing the Freeway Phantom Killer. D.C. crime and homicide rates were going up in the late 60s through the 70s. In the early 70s, more than 70% of the population of D.C. was black, and the Maryland Police Department hired almost exclusively white officers, who were usually more preoccupied with political organizers and unrest over the Vietnam War than the harm of black children. On April 25, 1971, 13-year-old Carol Spinks and her twin sister Carolyn were left at home by their mother, who was visiting a relative, and instructed them to stay inside or risk a whooping. Carol was a spunky girl known to be a tomboy. Their elder sister, who lived across the hall, convinced Carol to take $5 and go to the nearby 7-Eleven for groceries. On her way to the store, Carol was spotted by her mother, who told her she would get her punishment later, before allowing Carol to continue the errand. Carol was seen inside the 7-Eleven and later leaving it, but never arrived home. Her mother reported her missing. Six days later, her body was found behind St. Elizabeth's Hospital by a group of children. She was strangled and raped. The autopsy found citrus in her stomach, indicating her killer had abducted her, fed her while he had kept her alive for a few days, and then disposed of her. Green synthetic fibers were found on her clothing and her shoes were missing. Fast forward to July 9th. 16-year-old Darlenia Johnson, last seen heading off to the Oxen Run Rec Center for work by her mother, was reported missing when she never arrived. Two witnesses reported seeing her, one saying she was with a boyfriend, whose mother never allowed him to be questioned by the police, and the other saying she was riding in an older black car with an older black man. These leads led nowhere. Meanwhile, on July 12th, a D.C. Department of Highways and Traffic employee found the body of a black teenager 15 feet away from where the body of Carol Spinks was found. Upon calling 911, he was informed that the police had received an earlier call about the body and that someone was on their way to check it out. So, are you ready for the fuckery? Dispatchers sent officers who said they found nothing, even though my research indicates they never got out of the car, and on July 19th, the traffic employee returned to the site of the body and couldn't believe that it was still there, decomposing and rotting in the open summer heat. He reached out to his boss, who reached out to a friend, who happened to be a DC police sergeant, who personally went and found the body. It turned out to be the corpse of Darlenia Johnson. She was so badly decomposed from elemental damage that they couldn't determine cause of death or even if she had been sexually abused. They had to identify her by cutting off her fingertips to match the prints. Her shoes, like Carol Spinks, were missing, but this wasn't a dot that would be connected until later. Two days after Darlenia had gone missing, 14-year-old Angela Denise Barnes went missing. She was later found dead of a gunshot to the head. On July 27th, 10-year-old Brenda Faye Crockett of Northwest DC was sent to the local Safeway for bread and dog food. When she left, her hair was in pink curlers and she wasn't wearing shoes. When she didn't return in a timely manner, her parents and neighbors set out to search for her. Her seven -year old sister Bertha was at home and within an hour Bertha received a phone call from Brenda who said that a white man had picked her up but now she was taking a cab home. Brenda called 25 minutes later again this time while her mother's boyfriend was in the house. He answered the phone. Brenda stated that she was in Virginia and then asked if her mother had seen her confusing the boyfriend because she had just stated she was in Virginia and her mother was in DC. When the boyfriend pressed for clarification Brenda said, well, I'll see you, and the call disconnected. 
Only eight hours after she had gone missing, Brenda's body was found by a hitchhiker along Route 50 across the district line in Cheverly. Like Carol, she had been sexually assaulted and strangled. Curiously, her feet were completely clean, though she had left her home barefoot, leading investigators to believe the culprit had washed her at some point. She had a scarf tied around her neck and green fibers were found. On October 1st, 1971, 12-year-old Nino Mashia Yates, known affectionately as Nino, went to the local Safeway for flour, sugar, and paper plates. On her way home, she was abducted. When she was discovered a few hours shortly after, her body was still warm. Like the previous victims, she had been sexually assaulted, strangled, and had green synthetic fibers on her person. A neighbor saw her get into a blue Volkswagen at some point, but thought nothing of it. After Nemo's death, the police officially recognized they had a serial killer on their hands, and the media would come to dub the killer as the Freeway Phantom Killer. It was at this point that the FBI joined the investigation. On November 15th, 18-year-old Brenda Denise Woodard went out with a friend to Ben's Chili Bowl. She was enrolled in night classes at Cordozo High School and carried with her books on algebra, typewriting, and shorthand. The friend usually drove them home after meeting, but that night his car was in the shop. So they boarded a bus together before parting ways when Brenda got off the transfer to another bus. This was the last time she was seen alive. Just six hours later, her body was discovered near Route 202, near the bus stop her mother often waited at. Not only had Brenda Denise been sexually assaulted, but there was evidence that she fought her attacker and was eventually stabbed three times. Remember how I said the press had just taken a calling the freeway phantom killer, well, the freeway phantom killer. The perpetrator seemed to relish this name. In Brenda's pocket, they found a note in Brenda's handwriting. Evidently, the killer had dictated a message for her to write before killing her. In it, he mentioned his hatred of women, writing, quote, this is tantamount to my insensitivity to people, especially women. I will admit the others when you catch me if you can. It was signed the freeway phantom. Multiple elements of Brenda's murder stood out. For one, at 18, she was significantly older than most of the other victims and probably more alert to predators. Family mentioned she knew about the Phantom Freeway Killer, and she was also described as someone who wouldn't get into a car with a stranger. Next, police found a hair belonging to a white person and a hair belonging to a black person on her body, which they were never able to match. Lastly, Brenda was still wearing her boots, unlike the other victims who had been found without shoes. So. 10 months passed without any murders attributed to the freeway phantom killer. On September 6, 1972, the body of 17-year-old Diane Denise Williams is found by a trucker. Diane was a 17-year-old junior at Ballou Senior High School, known to be very fashionable with dreams of becoming a model. The night before her body was found, she was last seen with her boyfriend, who she had been dating all summer. Like the other victims, Diane Denise had been strangled, but unlike the other victims, her shoes were removed and not discarded, but placed neatly next to her body. There was no evidence of sexual assault to her genitals, though police did find semen on Diane's clothing, initially believed to come from her boyfriend, who denied sexual activity. We'll come back to the semen. In a newspaper report after her death, the journalist noted, police emphasized there may be more than one freeway phantom. On November 29, 1972, a high school senior named Tierra Ann Bryant was found floating in the Anacostia River. She had been strangled and reported missing two days earlier when she had never returned home from a doctor's appointment at Leland Memorial Hospital. She is not considered by local police to be a victim of the freeway phantom killer, though the FBI does consider her to be the final victim. So cops really didn't do most of their work until during during the second half of these murders when they were connected by media and the FBI arrived. In 1974, the FBI created a task force to investigate with 100 detectives and federal agents at its peak. By this time, they were chasing down every lead and eventually came up with a list of hundreds of suspects. In addition to the owner of a teen club where Darlenia hung out at, 
a St. Elizabeth's Hospital psychiatrist, and a four-star general who were all eventually cleared, what suspects did they come up with? On April 1st, 1974, it was reported that two former patrol cops were held for the murder of Angelina Denise Barnes, eventually leading police to conclude that she had never been a victim of the Freeway Phantom Killer. She was the only victim who had been shot. So at the time that all of these murders were happening, there was another crime spree. A series of armed robberies slash gang rapes committed by a group of men riding around in a Chevy Green Vega between at least 1972 and 1973. The group became known as the Green Vega Gang, made up of a supposed family man slash ringleader named John Davis, a man named Morris Fatsy Warren, Paul Brooks, who police suspected in hundreds of rapes, Paul Flathead Fletcher, and Melvin Gray, a postal worker. At the time, DC had anywhere near 300 to 1,000 open rape cases, and investigators were hot on the trails of the Green Vega Gang for at least some of them. The gang committed their crimes around DC and Maryland near Washington Beltway, which seemed to overlap with the Phantom Highway murders. So Morris, Fatsy Warren, is arrested for a convenience store robbery that ends in injuries and one fatality. In exchange for conjugal visits with his girlfriend, he talked to the task force about the group's crimes and led them to rape sites. He also confessed that the group killed Brenda Woodard, but made no mention of the note found in her pocket. This evidence had been left out of newspapers. Investigators leaned more into the Green Vega gang theory, despite this flaw. It seemed to add up, considering one of the gang's rape victims said the ringleader, John Davis, drove past a location near where Brenda's body was found and said, that's where I kill little girls. Though this didn't match with Morris Fatsy Warren's story, the investigators continued to allow the Green Vega gang to dominate the investigation. Shortly after, Melvin Gray, the postal worker, came forward to get his own deal, claiming that the gang was involved with the deaths of Carol Spinks and Nino Yates' murders. However, Melvin Gray had been at work during Yates' murder, and there were other inconsistencies. Eventually, the task force realized the filthy gang of rapists had not actually committed the Freeway Phantom murder. This brings me to the most plausible suspect. There were a few profiles of the killer made by FBI investigators. One agent named Walter McLaughlin believed the killer to be a young black man with at least one or two years of higher learning, access to an automobile, and likely lived alone or with a dominating female figure. Another profile noted, he knew how to start conversations with women, but not how to maintain healthy relationships. The FBI profile also posed a theory for why there was such a long waiting period between Brenda Woodard and Diane Williams, other than the obvious theory that he was arrested or out of town during that time. The profile read, he may have had, quote, some difficulty with Brenda and retreated into his fantasies of past killings. They suggested that Brenda fighting back ruined the experience for him and scared him into laying low for a bit. A geographic profile of the killer from a 2006 police report showed the killer's comfort zone according to mathematic formulas of death times, abduction times, and body placements. The map showed the anchor point of the killer's comfort zone to be St. Elizabeth's Hospital, where Carol Spinks's and Darlenia Johnson's bodies were found. Not only was Robert Askins, a 50-year-old computer technician at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in the 1970s, but he was a former patient at the psychiatric facility. Back in 1938, when he was a 19-year-old member of the science club at Minor Teachers College, he served cyanide-laced whiskey to five sex workers at a brothel. One of them, 31-year-old Ruth McDonald, was fatally poisoned. Two days later, he stabbed to death a 26-year-old sex worker named Elizabeth Johnson at the same location. Upon his arrest, he told police he was a woman hater. At Robert's trial, it was revealed that he was a police informant who helped facilitate sex worker stings to have such women arrested. He was diagnosed as a schizophrenic and institutionalized before being released in 1952 when five months later he strangled 42-year-old Laura Cook to death. He got 20 years to life for this crime and initially served out his sentence in St. Elizabeth's before his conviction was overturned on a technicality in 1958. Later in the 70s, he was a computer technician at the hospital. People who knew him knew he said the word tantamount pretty regularly. Recall that the word was in the note found in Brenda Woodard's pocket. 
In March 1977, investigators executed a search warrant on Robert's home and found soiled women's scarves, photos of girls and young women, a knife used in another crime, and an essay from a girl. However, they didn't find anything that matched green fibers or anything that definitively tied him to the Freeway Phantom murders. That same year, it's not clear if it was because of the knife found in his home, but he was arrested and charged for the kidnaps and rapes of two women. He was sent to prison where he denied any responsibility in any crimes, let alone the Freeway Phantom murders. He was denied parole in 1995 at 76 and again at 81 in 2000, both examiners citing his powers of manipulation and deceit as reasons he could not be reasonably monitored, even at his old age. So it's entirely possible that Robert Askins killed these girls, but cannot be proven without a doubt. Meanwhile, the Freeway Phantom case is sat cold, though a few cops kept investigating, namely a black woman named Romaine Jenkins. Though she was not an initial investigator, she spent four years in homicide and eventually reopened the case in 1987 when she had more clout in her position. When DNA testing came around in the 90s, Jenkins found that law enforcement hadn't preserved evidence correctly, and this only added to the abhorrent neglect of Darlenia Johnson's body. We'll never know how much the investigation could have been aided if her body had been found in better condition and sooner. The murders of these seven black girls sent shockwaves through DC's black community and changed their families. Some relatives ended up addicted to drugs and fell into depression. Valerie Moore, the older sister of Carol Spinks, who sent her to the 7-Eleven, felt extremely guilty. For years, she'd walked the same route Carol did, hoping to come across the man who killed her sister. Diane Denise Williams' sister went on to be a cop, thinking she might eventually find her sister's killer, and ended up managing a child abuse unit. A 2018 Washington Post profile on the case detailed how Romaine Jenkins, now retired, still obsesses over details and hopes that the families of the victims gets the closure they deserve. She theorized that the killer was in the military or a transient. She, nor James Trainum, who revisited the case in 2009, believed Robert Askins was the killer, with Trainum I'm saying, investigators at the time, quote, tried to squeeze him into the box they created and it just wasn't working. Both Jenkins and Trainum believed the killer to have been black, citing the Brenda Faye Crockett phone call as the killer's decision to misdirect the police into believing he was in Virginia and white. They also believed a white man would have been easily spotted or remembered in black neighborhoods where the girls went missing. Diane Williams' father, Leon, was quoted in 1980 as saying, if it was a white girl, the police would have found the person. I don't believe that police followed the leads they had. Why do they think the person was black? Why don't they investigate whites as well? He and others who followed his line of thinking could point to the 1975 disappearances of two white sisters named Sheila and Catherine Lyon. They were never found, but the case received constant attention and manpower, and a killer was eventually found in 2017. Trainum submitted the semen found on Diane Denise Williams for testing three times, and each time the sample remained untested. The last entity to have the sample in its possession is Maryland State Police. Trainum said as far as he knows, the MSP still have it, but they have done nothing, leading most to believe that the disorganized department mishandled the sample and lost it or contaminated it. Either way, they fucked up majorly. It's agonizing that this crucial bit of evidence is either tied up in red tape or lost. It could have been tested against Robert Askins and matched to him or somebody else entirely. Romaine Jenkins said in the 2018 article, quote, what happens when people like me and the families are gone? This will be forgotten. This was chilling and the final push I needed to make a video about the girls who lost their lives at the hands of the sadistic man dubbed the Freeway Phantom Killer. Without new evidence or a confession, this case will likely never be solved. Until that happens, if it ever does, the case of the Freeway Phantom Killer remains a mystery.